So a little bit about Target. Uh, we have 1,850 stores. I think it's like 1,855 technically. And then we are the eighth largest retailer in the US. US in there because like I mentioned, Canada. Uh, and then we have a variety of store formats. So for instance, if you're at a university, the store might look a little bit different than you're living in a suburb in Texas. It might be huge with a giant grocery uh, area. It's not even an aisle at this point. And then at a university, you might have the necessities, the bare necessities, ramen. Uh, and then we also have 20 office locations globally. And then we also have data centers. We have uh, distribution centers, fulfillment centers. We have so much going on around the country and around the world. And so just think about that. We have tons and tons of data. And then my team, uh, we forecast. So we take a bunch of data streams and we forecast what's going to happen for the next couple of days. And we use it as an operational tool to help with the anomaly detection, but also people use it to just get an understanding of their data. Uh, sometimes they visualize it for the first time with some of our forecasts and they say, oh, so this is what it looks like. Uh, here I have some pictures of our target.com website, uh, a store down there, uh, the mobile app. And so think about each one of these. Each one of these critical to the business. A lot of orders, a lot of page views, a lot of you name it, it's going on. But also behind them, think about how much work there is. APIs, uh, the servers running on them, uh, the, just all the technology underneath and it's all emitting data. So we don't take just business metrics, we take machine metrics, we take uh, API metrics, errors, name it, and we basically take it in and try to do something with it. And so previously we used to use a gradient boosting method with H2O AI, uh, it was just open source something, it was before I joined the team, but they were using that. Uh, we re-architected, we brought in Python libraries, Golang, uh, so I built an LSTM model architecture that helped speed up the training process and got better results. Um, and we're still continuously working on this. But really the harder part, in my opinion, is this next one. There we go. Uh, oh, there's no animation. Oh, uh, the anomaly detection, in my opinion, is a lot harder. And I've had conversations outside about this in the, in the hall. And the reason is because uh, before the animations were going to happen, uh, that second missing data point was not there. There was one. So contextually speaking, that's anomalous, right? You have a stream of data, all of a sudden nothing, it continues on and it keeps going. Well, so teams that we work with might say, yes, this was a huge issue, everything stops working. Well, what happens about every night, what if you get this, right? And that happens with stores. Stores overnight are closed, and we're only in the US, so we don't have stores globally that are open 24 seven. And so therefore, it is normal to have no data emitted at certain points in the day. However, with certain metrics and data streams, like the number of orders you're getting, it might report back zero. It might actually give you a number. Whereas in API cases, there is no API running right now. It's emitting nothing, so you get no data. And then, so you have to generalize some of these algorithms you're developing for anomaly detection because if there's missing data, sometimes that's not okay for this data stream. If there is missing data, sometimes it is. And then on top of that, every team has their own business logic they wanna add. They say that, well, between the hours of this and this, it's fine, we don't, we don't care too much. And so it's very subjective and we have no source of truth, okay? Every team comes to us and say, you caught this. Another team says, you did, you did not catch this. It's the same data, some team just views it differently. And so previously, we developed a rules-based system to help us with anomaly detection. Uh, it, it wasn't very scalable, so we had to go look elsewhere. Uh, and so we found this research called the Matrix Profile, developed out of the University of California, Riverside. And next slide. And we created a Python library called Matrix Profile TS. Oops, there we go. Uh, and so Matrix Profile, a little bit about it is it's essentially a data transformation. Uh, what you're seeing here is conceptually how it works. And so what happens, it creates this thing called a distance profile. And here, it's, it's hard to see, but up top, there's a red line, and that's just your data, your data coming. And in this case, what it did is it took that data stream, put it on the other axis, you take a subset, and you just comb over it and say, okay, how similar is this subset to the rest of the data stream? And then at the bottom, you have this white line, and that's really the matrix profile. And what that 
is actually showing you is what's called discords and motifs. All that means is the discords are the peaks, the motifs are the low values. And what that tells you is that the discords is where your data does not look like the rest of it. The motifs, the bottom part, is it looks pretty similar to the rest of the data stream. And now, it, if you think about it, this is putting it on itself. You can also do this with multiple data streams. So if you have a data stream, you want to look at maybe somewhere else in the company you're getting data from them, and you think maybe it's related, you could probably do some autocorrelation or correlation. You could also throw it in here and say, how similar is this to the rest of it? I think in the paper they've done studies on plagiarism with like music, so the sound waves. I think they tested out uh, Under Pressure by Queen and then also Ice Ice Baby by Vanilla Ice to see how similar they really were because uh, I think there's a huge plagiarism case with that. Uh, anyway, so we took this, we read the research papers, we developed it in Python, made it scalable, made it performant, and then we open sourced it with Target through Target and you can download it via pip, Python. You can go to the GitHub, contribute. Um, I think at this point we have, this says 37,000 downloads. I think last time I checked too, in over 60 countries, the US was number one. I think China might have been number two. Uh, I think I saw some universities from China were actively, I don't know if they're forking it, but they were downloading it for sure. And some of the first issues and PRs we got were from China in Chinese. And I didn't speak Chinese, so I had to use Google Translate to try and converse with these people about their issues in Python. It turns out it's a Python 2 to Python 3 issue, of course. Uh, and then we did a little blog post about this when we first open sourced it, and we wanted to do a benchmark, so I slapped together a GPU implementation of one of the algorithms called Stomp, and we were able to process 20 years of data in less than 20 seconds. I think it was technically 17 seconds, and 20 years of data in five minute aggregation so about two to three million rows, and it was pretty impressive. I didn't believe it at first when I first saw the results, and then I ran it again, and it showed up again as about 17 seconds, so. Uh, and then we did this on a GPU for NVIDIA K80, so of course it's a lot faster. And I'll mention about the algorithms in a little bit. You can calculate this matrix profile in multiple ways. And, next slide. Um, but anyway, so Stomp is one of the methods. In the paper, they mention it's embarrassingly parallelizable, so that's why it was so fast on a GPU. I'm trying to get this to go, there we go. Uh, here's a little diagram about, like I mentioned, there's multiple algorithms. Uh, so Stomp is the one that I primarily use. It distributes everything, it's super parallelizable. The bottom two are Stomp and Scrimp, so you probably can't see the little legend, but what's important is the bottom two, Scrimp essentially takes a sample. It doesn't calculate the entire matrix profile because sometimes you don't need it, you just need an approximation, and it gets a pretty good approximation. Therefore, you need less data, it can do it faster. Um, we also have an API redesign going out that you see this, well, about 20 times faster and more performant. So we're excited about that in the future. Next slide. There we go. Uh, so here, we, I mentioned how can we use this and the answer is I've used it to label data. You'll see the model comparison. This is how I will basically calculate the anomalies. Uh, and so the bottom part is the matrix profile. You're not supposed to see these two lines yet, but the, this blue line is essentially you can set a threshold. So like I said, the peaks are where it's very, very different than the rest of the time series. And obviously you can see in the raw data up top, we change it drastically on purpose. And then you'll see these spikes. So therefore you could say something like, okay, set a threshold. If it goes past this threshold, it's probably anomalous or just acting differently. You can change that with sensitivity. Uh, you can make it configurable. You can calculate like I've done. Um, just take the standard deviation from the mean of the matrix profile and just find out what's going on with it. Uh, or like this last bullet point, what I've also done and tried is sending these two data points or data representations into a model. And therefore, you can start to train a model on how to do anomaly detection. And, oops, there we go. So you can take the data points, put it in as features among other features if you have them, and then you can start to determine what is anomalous and have a model do the heavy lifting for you, and then you can deploy the model so that way you don't have to do as much. Uh, oops. Another way you can use this, one second is uh, like I mentioned motifs. Here you can see, so I made up these data points up top, uh, the raw data, and 
they're supposed to be pretty random. The bottom part shows you that even though they're supposed to be somewhat random, the scales are completely different. One's in the hundreds, I believe, and the other one's in single digits. Uh, the matrix profile does look pretty similar, and so you can start doing things like I mentioned, if this data stream's over here in one part of the company and I have this other one too, are they similar? You can do correlation tests on that as well, but you can feed these into a model as well. And so I did a model comparison on some data I had from Target. Um, I added some synthetic anomalies. I kept some that were already there. And what you see here is that we used an LSTM network to classify it, and it worked out pretty well. The F-score was the best. Precision recall, too. Uh, just fully connected network also worked out pretty well. Uh, obviously, I understand this doesn't mean a whole lot because it's very much specific to the data I used and the hyperparameters, the model architecture, et cetera. It's just meant to convey that we can send these into a model and get some type of result back and use it for, in our case, anomaly detection and an intelligent anomaly detection at that. All right, future states. What we're really looking forward to is releasing a GPU implementation and actual production implementation of this. So the one I did was pretty hacked together just to get a benchmark out of it. Uh, we wanna actually put one out there, make it as simple to use for users, that way it doesn't really matter for you, maybe what GPU you use, AMD versus NVIDIA, um, what language you're using. Obviously you might not wanna write CUDA code, uh, you might just wanna use Python or R or something else. Uh, and then we also wanna unify the different libraries, so there is a foundation now out there called the Matrix Profile Foundation that maintains multiple implementations of this in different languages. So there's a Golang, there's an R, and then we were trying to get this Python one under that umbrella as well so they can help maintain it. Uh, they've also been in communication with the research lab to partner and do some work there. Uh, and then also multi-series inputs. So like I mentioned before, I showed you it was comparing the time series to itself for anomalies. We wanna be able to add multiple different time series into there so that we can start seeing the matrix profile for many different ones. Uh, API redesign already hinted at before. It increased performance, scalability. Uh, I think we saw about 20x speed up, and on that graph, the more data points you sent it, it didn't actually exponentially lose performance, which was really nice. Um, it was more of a, like, a log relationship than anything. Uh, and then we also wanna build on partnerships as well because this is a lot of fun. A lot of great work has been here. Um, we would love to see more people using it. The person that wrote the Golang implementation I know is working at LinkedIn out here. Uh, the person that wrote the R implementation is actually in Portugal. Um, and somehow he manages to get on some of our phone calls and is awake into the late night. Uh, but these partnerships are gonna be very valuable in the future and especially if you wanna see this grow and a lot more use cases. So I'm gonna finish it up for Q&A. Uh, if you're interested or wanna talk, feel free to reach out. Uh, my team is expanding in 2020, so for some reason you decide you wanna move to Minneapolis. Uh, and want, think this is kind of interesting, let me know. And there's also a pretty basic UI out there that the foundation has developed to just play around with what is matrix profile, what is a discord, what are these different subsets of the transformed data. So, thank you. <laughs>